Mary Chesnut was the daughter of a South Carolina governor and the wife of a former U.S. senator. She kept a journal during the Civil War. February 18th, 1861. I do not allow myself vain regrets or sad foreboding. This Southern Confederacy must be supported now by calm determination and cool brains. We have risked all, and we must play our best, for the stake is life or death. Yet I feel a nervous dread and horror of this break with so great a power as the United States. But I am ready and willing. I want them to fight and stop talking. I shall always regret that I had not kept a journal during the last two delightful and eventful years. The delights having exhausted themselves in the latter part of 1860, and the events crowding in so that it takes away one's breath to think about it all. But now it is to me one nightmare from the time I heard that Lincoln was elected and our fate sealed. We stood on the balcony to see our flag go up. We are separated north from south. We are divorced because we have hated each other so. We only want to separate from them. And they put such an inordinate value on us. They are willing to risk all, life and limb and all their money to keep us. They love us so. Fort Sumter has been on fire. I do not pretend to go to sleep. How can I? My husband has gone to demand the fort surrender. At half past four, the heavy booming of a cannon, I sprang out of bed. I went to the housetop. The shells were bursting. And who could tell what each volley accomplished of death and destruction? The women were wild there on the housetop. In Mrs. Davis's drawing room last night, the president, Jefferson Davis himself, took a seat by me and talked for nearly an hour. We think every Southerner equal to three Yankees, at least. We will have to be equivalent to a dozen now. He believes that we will do all that can be done by pluck and muscle, endurance, and dogged courage. And yet, there was a sad refrain running through it all. He thinks it will be a long war. That floored me. Then he said, before the end came, we would have many a bitter experience. He said only fools doubted the courage of the Yankees or their willingness to fight when they saw fit. And now that we have stung their pride, we have roused them till they will fight like devils. June 29, 1862. My dear Mary, for the last three days, I have been witness of the most stirring events of modern times. The fight on Friday was the largest and fiercest of the whole war some 60 or 70,000. Our line was three times repulsed when General Lee, assembling all his generals to the front, told them that if night came without victory, all was lost, and the work must be done by the bayonet. Our men then made a rapid and irresistible charge and carried everything. I think the end must be decisive in our favor lost many men and many officers. I hear Alex Haskell and young McMahon are among them, as well as a son of Dr. Trezevant. Very sad indeed. With devotion, yours, James Chestnut, Jr. Columbia, South Carolina. There was much talk around the table today. This war was undertaken by us to shake off the yoke of foreign invaders, so we consider our cause righteous. The Yankees, 
since the war has begun, have discovered it is to free the slaves that they are fighting. So their cause is noble. They also expect to make the war pay. Yankees do not undertake anything that does not pay. They think we belong to them. We have been good milk cows, milked by the tariff, or skimmed. We bear the ban of slavery. They get the money. Cotton pays everybody who handles it, sells it, manufactures it, but rarely pays the man who grows it. Second hand, the Yankees received the wages of slavery. They grew rich. We grew poor. June, 1862. Stonewall Jackson has defeated Fremont and taken all his cannon and plenty of prisoners. Plenty, no doubt, and enough and to spare. We can't feed our own soldiers, and how are we to feed prisoners? Oranges are five dollars apiece. In the street, a barrel of flour sells for one hundred and fifteen dollars. We spent seventy-five dollars today for a little tea and sugar and have five hundred left. Richmond, Virginia. During Stoneman's raid on a Sunday, I was in Mrs. Randolph's pew. The Battle of Chancellorsville was also raging. The rattling of the ammunition wagons, the tramp of soldiers, the everlasting slamming of those iron gates of the Capitol Square just opposite the church made it hard to attend to the service. Oh, such a day. I have been with Mrs. Randolph to all the hospitals. I can never again shut out of view the sights I saw there of human misery. Long rows of dead and dying, awful sights. I do not remember any more, for I fainted. Now I have deemed it wise to do my hospital work from the outside. I felt humiliated at having to make this confession of weakness. On the journey to our plantation, we did not see one living thing, man, woman, or animal. The blooming of the gardens had a funereal effect. Mrs. Bartow drove with me to our house. On one side, every window had been broken, every piece of furniture destroyed, every door smashed in. Our books, our letters, our papers were strewed along the Charleston Road. Sherman only took our horses. Potter's raid ruined us finally, burning our mills and gins and a hundred bales of cotton. Indeed, nothing is left now but the bare land and the debts contracted for the support of hundreds of Negroes during the war. May 21st, 1865. How the Negroes have flocked to the Yankee squad which has recently come. The colored women carried bouquets to the Yankees, making the day a jubilee. June 12, 1865. I hear that in New York, people have been simply intoxicated with the fumes of their own glory. Military prowess is a new wrinkle of delight to them. They are mad with pride that ten to one they could, after five years hard fighting, prevail over us. July 26th, 1865. I do not write often now, not for want of something to say but from a loathing of all I see and hear. And why dwell upon these things? August 2nd, 1865. I am old, old, old. The weight of the years that hangs upon my eyelids is of lead. But there is youth in even our world still. The entry of August 2, 1865 was the last in Mary Chesnut's journal.